إن كتقش مذا دكتور كوليف شقشت مكشي شو هو دكتور كوليف يو سي سان دييغو دا دكتور لوك درجة نن ثنقي ألميش لرني كتشريا أنن أم ألميش جن ستيت يونيفرستي دا ألميش جن دولت يونيفرستينا Graduate Research Assistant to all of us, and I'm a scholar, I'm a scholar, I'm a scholar at Karaninsk Institute, where I'm a chemist and molecular biology, and I'm a doctor of the university, and I'm a doctor of the university. I'm a doctor of the university, and I'm a doctor of the university. Roadmap to vaccine development against group A streptococcus infection. That is the way we have to do it. What is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? Okay, so I I want to identify myself as a protein scientist. I, I work on a cellular and a molecular level. So today I'm going to try to give you an idea how science is implemented before tackling any uh, disease, infectious disease, uh, COVID disease, for example. So I want to have like a general idea how scientists uh, work on those kind of diseases uh, in, in, a, in laboratory. Okay, so a little bit about myself. So back in high school, I was good at chemistry. So naturally I just did my major in chemistry and uh, uh, during my summers, I spent my time doing internships, gaining lab experience. And during my college years, I kind of uh, developed the interest in how chemistry actually works in the living system. So then I just ended up uh, getting a minor degree in biology. So using those kind of experiences that I graduated in May and I applied to a uh, PhD program in August. I start, started my PhD in Michigan State University, and uh, my thesis was on about uh, zinc deficiency protein and COVID 4. So I really dive into a protein in chemistry and I gained skills during my PhD years. And uh, <laughs> now I'm working in the uh, University of California, San Diego, which is specialized in biological research and one of the top schools in the US. So this is a lab I'm working in. So this is a, our team. And uh, this is uh, Dr. Gosh, who is specialized in uh, uh, microbial infections. So whenever you join a lab, uh, you just take over uh, your PI's uh, project and you work on that. So this is my bench. So. Uh, we use a lot of uh, plastic tubes, pipettes, like bottles to keep our mediums, me media and buffers. I just wanted to give you an idea how our uh, workspace looks like, you know. <laughs> and we, our lab of fo focus on a uh, group A streptococcus. So strep means it's like a chain, caucus means surround. So these bugs, little bugs have a chain-like arrangement. So once this box infect us, then, the, the, then there's a real problem sometimes. So gas, so I'm going to refer group A streptococcus as gas. So gas is bacterial <laughs> pathogen that causes half a million deaths annually every year worldwide. And that puts it among top 10 infectious agents of mortality. So gas causes rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease, and streptococcal toxic shock syndrome. So among these diseases, rheumatic heart disease actually responsible for the most deaths, like uh, 320,000 deaths out of uh, half a million. So that's a main problematic disease in a gas infection. 
So I found the research in, about Turkmenistan. So they published in a New England Journal of Medicine. So in, back in 2015, there was identified like a 25,000 uh, rheumatic heart disease patients. And uh, in that year, like around 200 deaths were recorded. So how does uh, strep A infection progress? So it usually observed in uh, children aged to five to 15 in overcrowded areas with poor sanitation. So one of A's of strep A to infect is uh, starts from throat, throat infection. So if this throat in infection is not uh, taken care of, it can lead to uh, acute rheumatic fever. Then if prolonged acute rheumatic fever can cause a rheumatic heart disease, which is a chronic disease. So in the same study, there was a, um, the global map was uh, mapped uh, about uh, rheumatic heart disease. So you, we can see here, so they use some metrics, some statistics, and they uh, labeled some countries as endemic where uh, this rheumatic heart disease is prevalent. So we can see here like uh, African countries was labeled as rheumatic heart disease. There's a correlation between less developed countries and with this disease. And Turkmenistan also was labeled as an endemic because of uh, the statistics. So this number is greater than 0.15 and Turkmenistan was like 0.7. So what's the virulence factor of this uh, strep A, right? So let's say that this is a strep A. Strep A is comprised of M proteins on their cell wall. And this M proteins binds to human proteins to enable strep A uh, to resist the immune system killing. So in other way, strep A uses our protein to, uh, uh, to evade, to escape, uh, our immune system killing from, from our system. So in the absence of M protein, a strep A is easily killed by our, our, uh, our immune system. So what's the research strategy here we are trying to implement is uh, to study this uh, interaction between M protein and human proteins. So there are uh, multiple uh, human proteins. So my other colleagues work on uh, uh, other human proteins, I'm focusing on interaction with the fibrinogen and M protein. So fibrinogen is a blood clotting protein. Whenever we have a wound, there's uh, fibrinogen. And if we can study this interaction and try to uh, uh, block this interaction, then uh, there's a protein called C3B and if C3B could come to onto a strep A surface, then our immune system can respond and can kill this strep A. So that's the kind of goal, try to uh, find the binding motif of M protein and fibrinogen, which is unknown currently. So how can we uh, <clears throat> study this case, right? So in order to do that, so proteins are very, very small uh, molecules, so it's invisible to human eye. So we need to develop the technique how to visualize this interaction first. And that's where X-ray crystallography comes in. For X-ray crystallography, we of course use X-rays and crystals. So that's two important thing to mention. So why crystals? So in crystals, atoms are arranged in a specific order. So they have limited motion. So once X-rays go through a crystal and goes through atom, there's an electron in atom and X-ray diffracts and leaves uh, this kind of a diffraction pattern on a film. And using this diffraction pattern and using some advanced math equations, we can get atomic model. So, so now we need X-rays, we need crystals, and we need M protein fibrinogen in a crystal. So that's kind of idea how we're going to uh, proceed this uh, science. So we need to isolate M protein and fibrinogen and get them into a crystal. And how do we uh, isolate these proteins? This is kind of a lab techniques, very commonly used. So we uh, use a DNA plasmid. This, we put inside this DNA plasmid the genetic code of M protein. So we tell bacteria how to make this M protein. So we design this plasmid and uh, put it in the bacteria. Then now bacteria knows how to make M protein. And we just grow it overnight. 
and then centrifuge it, and we get the bacterial pill down here and use a sonicator. A sonicator lies the cells just by bursting with the ultrasound, and we just get a cocktail of bacteria, I mean, bacterial protein, right? So from out of it, we can just purify M protein and we just, we got our M protein. And we use other uh, lab technique called the size exclusion chromatography. This chromatography uh, can separate mixture of proteins to, into samples. So for example, we use this column here, uh, protein goes from this end, comes out of from this end, during this travel, the uh, smaller proteins separate from the bigger proteins, and that's we can like uh, we can uh, separate proteins here. For example, in this orange line, we can see two peaks. One is here, and the, another one is here. So that means there are two proteins present, and we can separate them and uh, and purify protein. Right. So we get our protein complex in a, in a very small tube and try to set up for crystallization, right? So how does this crystallization work? So we, for that, we use reservoir solutions, right? So let's say, you can, you can say reservoir solution is com composed of some chemicals. And we use these chemicals to mix with pr protein uh, sample and we can get a drop. Sorry, you didn't share with Zoom audience. Okay. Just realized, sorry. Sorry. Okay. So then we get a, a drop on the cover slip, and then we can. Uh, Flip this uh, cover slip and push to on on, a, on, a, on top of this well, and well is covered with a grease, right? So once we push it, we get isolated system. So nothing goes in, nothing goes out. So since we mixed reservoir solution with a drop, now composition of this drop and the reservoir solution are different, right? Because of this difference, uh, this drop is trying to mimic the reservoir solution, and there is a there is kind of undergoes some change. It's called vapor diffusion water starts evaporating from this drop into this reservoir solution that makes drop shrink. And because of this force that move, uh, um, this force uh, uh, forces molecules to move. And if we are get lucky, we can get crystal. So now imagine we have 500 reservoir solutions, right? So that's a little bit, uh, difficult to do manually so that's why we use this kind of robot it's called the mosquito robot so even Adler, yeah. so we i put like i place protein samples here and uh, then it can screw it distribute uh, among a uh, among cover slide and then it's going to mix it with the reservoir solution so now it takes from reservoir solution and that mixes the protein complex with a, mix it with a protein complex. So you can actually see the drops here, I guess. You can see it mixes with a protein complex. Then we, I, we, then we take this cover slit and flip it to reservoir solution and slide it, then we get isolated system. So this is the first screening process. Then after we find the, correct reservoir solution, we then recreate this manually to bigger drops and we try to recreate this crystal uh, setup. So now analogy would be, let's say we, uh, the molecules are bricks. Oops. So molecules are bricks. So if, if, if they get uh, orderly arranged in a solution, then we get uh, kind of crystals. If, if they just pile up like a, like a, uh, what's called rubble, then we get precipitate. So majority of the drops would be this kind of precipitate. And if we are get lucky, we get uh, one or two drops uh, out of 500 as, as a crystals. So then what we do with these crystals, we, we use uh, cryo loops. We use cryo loops to pick up these crystals. Uh, it's called crystal fishing. So, crystallic. 
then we use cry uh, cry loops to pick up uh, these crystals. Like try to, uh, to put your cry loop under the crystal and pick it up, and then we use a we use a liquid nitrogen to, fr to freeze these crystals in a cryo loop, and we put it in the dewar and ship it to uh, Argonne National Lab, which is located in Illinois. So they have advanced photon source. So they use uh, particle accelerators to get electrons up to uh, on the speed of light. And from that, they get a different kind of uh, uh, beam lines, high energy beam lines. So there, there's a reason why they built this building in a circle. Okay. So once our crystals arrive to uh, the Argon National Lab. There's a staff over there. They pick up our crystals and mount it, mount them on, 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 a, on a, in a, another robot, and then we take over control of this robot remotely. So we use X-rays to diffract our crystals in a cryo loop, and then we get a diffraction image out of this. Then uh, we try to get as many images as possible because uh, because it depends really depends on durability of crystal. So too much X-ray exposure can kill, can 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 destroy the crystal uh, eventually. Then we use uh, uh, computer softwares to get uh, electron density map out of this information. As you may see, there's a blue web kind of uh, 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 pattern here. That's electron density map, and the light green model is actually the Amino acids. So in nature, we know there are 20 amino acids. So once we see an electron density map like a bigger, then let's say, hey, here should be a tryptophan. And we put tryptophan there, and it's kind of a jigsaw game. You need to uh, try to build up into electron density map. Okay. After a month or two, uh, Working on that model, then we finally get a protein structure. So you may recognize this elongated coil coil structure is belongs to M protein. And this one is like a fibrinogen. So I, I have here a surface view of this complex. So here is a binding site and here, is, and this is just fibrinogen. And this side is actually not contacting uh, to a, any any protein. Okay, so then after getting a crystal structure, the complex stu structure, there's always a question if that's a real contact or or uh, or is, is a crystal artifact. So we so does does it have a biology biological sense? So we always have to test it. For example, when we look at the contact, let's say we have a the, we have a side chain amino acid with a a positive charge and there's a negative charge. So they attract each other and then that's how they stay together. What if I mutate this negative charge uh, side chain amino acid is gonna lose a contact here. So we are on a STS page, for example, then so this lower band belongs to M protein and upper band belongs to fibrinogen. So once I mutate this negative charge amino acid to positive charge, I lose, I lose the interaction. Right, so how can this help to further proceed our experiment? So here, then I, since I found, the, found this interaction, so I can say this side of the protein actually make contact. So I don't need this side because it's not doing anything. So by, uh, then I can reconstruct my, uh, my protein uh, just using the binding side as my antigen for further experiment. Okay, so. I use this antigen in the vivo study. So in the thir third step, uh, so we actually need to test this uh, protein in a living system. We send our antigen to a company that works with rabbits. So they inject this uh, uh, part of the protein and uh, this antigen stimulates response in a rabbit. Right, so rabbit grows like a, in, a, in a two or three months. Then, then, and in response to this antigen, they make antibodies. Then we get the, this blood sample and we test if these antibodies actually uh, 
going to kill strep A. So we mimic our, our blood system. We put, then, then we put uh, strep A there, we put antibodies and we put some human cells and test if this, uh, if this going to uh, kill uh, the strep A, right? So we are currently on, on, on this stage of the project. So we haven't done this yet, but we, we have this set up in our lab so we can do it. Okay, so how this proposed, uh, how our work uh, can contribute to gas infection prevention and therapeutics. So before I go to that, I wanna talk about uh, types of vaccines. So there are several types of vaccines. One is a live attenuated vaccine. In this case, live but weakened vaccine is given to us. And uh, then our body uh, uh, responds to it and they develop a, the old protection case, like we can give examples from this, uh, like a measles, chicken pox, and there are other cases like inactivated vaccine. So RNA vaccine is actually uh, what they use in COVID. I'm gonna talk about this. And in subunit vaccine, actually we are given uh, that uh, <coughs> antigen protein, okay? So what happened in, uh, in, in the COVID vaccine, right? So you may ask. So in COVID vaccine, so let's say we have a SARS-CoV-2, right? This is a COVID. So COVID has spike protein. So you can make analogy, strep A got M protein, COVID got spike protein. So scientists design mRNA that actually carries uh, genetic code to make this uh, spike protein, right? So we got, injected this mRNA to our muscle cells and muscle cells took this mRNA information, they actually made this spike protein on our system. And then our immune cells recognized that, hey, should it be here? And then they start uh, uh, developing a reaction to it and they eventually end up making antibodies to start a cascade of reactions, right? So then, cell that makes this antibody is called a memory cell. Okay, so life of mRNA is very short. So it's gone in a couple of days and this proteins also would be gone in, in a couple of weeks. So what we are left actually with is memory cell that knows how to make these antibodies. We get boosters, so make sure this memory cell stays in the memory. So emphasis here is this, this antibodies. So in both cases, we need antibodies. So how, how, how can we make similar thing against gas infection? Actually, since we found the crystal structure, 3D pattern of this M protein. So in both cases, so we can, we can uh, against gas infection, we can do both cases, like both vaccine and antibody therapy, right? So in, in, for vaccination, we can use that uh, antigen as a subunit vaccination and then we can give a, we can like into a link. So this first need, needs to test in a other, uh, uh, like a rabbit or something, then we'll see what happens there. However, so in vaccine case, so immune response develops in a, in a, in a, in a week or two, right? Maybe three. And vaccine helps, uh, aims to help the body to prevent infection in future and expected to provide long-term protection. So how, how antibody therapy helps? So sometimes uh, patients come to hospital, they are already infected, so they don't have two, three weeks. They need, they need immediate help. In that case, we, we can use, uh, antibodies can, can be used, so they work immediately and they can help uh, cure this Ill, illness if the patient is already infected. Yeah, so this is kind of an idea what we are doing in our lab. So it's not like a finished project, but uh, this is where we're at right now. Yeah, I think that's about it. So my uh, research is being funded by NIH and we use Argon Lab. Sometimes we send it to Stanford based on uh, availability. And I want to thank Tasa for giving me this platform to share my research. Thank you. Thank you.